All right, can you see my slides? Perfect. All right, well, welcome again. We're so excited to have you. Today's program is part of the Presidential Primary Sources Project. We do this every year and traditionally our programs run from January to March. Today's presentation is coming to us from the Clinton Presidential Library and it's called President Clinton's Public Diplomacy in Northern Ireland. The Presidential Primary Sources Project is a partnership between Internet2, the National Park Service, and the National Archives. And this is just a quick disclaimer. Um, by participating today, you are agreeing to be recorded and archived as part of our program. We do keep YouTube recordings of all of these programs on our YouTube channel just so that students and teachers can access them even if they couldn't attend live or if they need to go back to them. Um, again, we're excited to have everyone here and we'd love for you to participate as much as possible today. So I just wanna go over a few opportunities and expectations for participating. Um, when you registered, you were able to indicate whether or not you wanted to be on video. So if you did indicate that you wanted to be on video, I've promoted you so that you can access that option. Um, if I haven't promoted you and you would like to be able to access your video, just leave something in the chat and I'll work on promoting you when I'm done with the introductions here. Um, whether you're on video or not, you can also participate with your voice. Um, so there will be opportunities where your presenter will ask you to answer a question or ask a question. Um, and if you want to use your voice to answer that, you can use the little raise hand function. It looks like a little yellow hand. Um, and I will call on you and work to unmute you so that you can respond that way. And then of course we have the chat box. So please feel free to use the chat box as much as you want to be able to ask and answer questions for our presenter. And then finally, just make sure that you're respectful of these interactive tools. We do want you to participate as much as possible, but we also wanna make sure the conversation stays focused on what we're here to talk about today. All right, just one last thank you. Um, we love having everybody here. If you wanna learn more about our future programs or see, find our recordings, you can check out our website here, internet2.edu slash PPSP. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and hand it off to Kathleen here. Thank you, Therese. Uh, I'm Kathleen Pate. I am the Education Specialist at the Clinton Presidential Library. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about President Clinton and public diplomacy in Northern Ireland. So before we get started, I wanted to kind of do a little icebreaker and learn a little bit more about who you are and where you're from, but it's gonna be connected to the presentation. So I want to show you. So today is March 16th, which means tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. And I personally am a big fan of St. Patrick's Day. I have some Irish heritage and so I like to celebrate. It's a great excuse to wear some fun green socks or other green clothing. But there's something else that um, traditionally happens on St. Patrick's Day that connects to the presidency. And so specifically, um, the Prime Minister of Ireland gives to the President of the United States a crystal bowl full of shamrocks. Now this tradition actually started um, back in the Truman administration. So back in the late 40s, early 50s. And it wasn't the prime minister, it was an ambassador. Um, he didn't actually interact with President Truman. President Truman wasn't there, but he dropped off a box full of shamrocks. So we associate shamrocks with uh, Ireland. And so it's, it's kind of a symbol. And so I want you to think about, and I want you to put this in the chat, or if you're um, audio only, you can raise your hand using the little hand feature. But I would love to know where you're from and what would be something that you might give to someone that represents your state, your city. You could think of something that represents the United States. Um, but as the shamrock is very symbolic of Ireland, I want to be thinking about symbolic gifts. So for example, 
I'm in Arkansas. The Clinton Presidential Library is in Little Rock. I live about 35 miles uh, southeast of there in Pine Bluff. And we're known for a lot of things. We're known for being the, the gateway to the Delta. So we have a lot of agricultural products. So I might give a visiting dignitary some kind of agricultural product. We're also known for music. So I might give a visiting dignitary some local music. So, okay, so um, Rebecca says seashells. Where are you from? Where, where are you from that you would give seashells? And I see that um, Klaus is from Colorado. What might you give to represent Colorado? Either, um, okay, so flowers, a particular kind of flowers. And Rebecca is from the beach um, in Queens, New York. So seashells from the beach. Oh, I might like to, um, the Ten Mouth Mountain School is gonna give me uh, maple syrup. Looks like Ben is going to give me a cactus. Ben, where are you from that we, there would be a, a cactus? Is that the Sonoran Desert? I don't know if I'm quite saying that right. Arizona. Okay. Right. So those are different. And you guys came up with, um, so, oh, Wisconsin cheese, Hershey's chocolate. Is someone from Pennsylvania? All right, so, so things to eat and then also plants. So these are some great, these are some great answers. All right, so let's talk about, uh, before we dive in, I wanna talk for just a moment about, so that was a great icebreaker. Ooh, fudge from Mackinac Island. That would be great. Y'all are making me really hungry. I might have to have a snack. Um, I'll wait till the, till the program's over, don't worry. Okay, so these are these are great answers. Again, lots of, lots of food products. Um, but I wanna think just for a moment about what the president does, right? So what is the president's job? And the president knows what his job is. It's spelled out very clearly in a very important document. Does anyone know what he leads the country? But how does he know what to do? There's a document that tells us how our government runs. How do we know the branches of government? How do we know the duties of the branches of government? The Constitution, absolutely. So the Constitution spells out the branches of government and you guys know that there are how many? I know there's a little three, absolutely. So the legislative branch is defined in Article One, and what does the legislative branch do? It's made up of Congress, which is the Senate and the House. The legislative branch creates the laws. And then the president is the head of what branch? Defined in Article Two, the executive branch, absolutely. So Congress is the legislative branch, the House and the Senate, they pass the laws. The president is the head of the executive branch. So he executes or enforces the laws. And then last but not least, the final branch of government, the third branch of government, defined in Article Three of the Constitution, it's gonna be our system of courts, including the Supreme Court, the judicial branch, absolutely. So in the judicial branch looks not only at laws, but how laws are enforced and make sure that both of those fit with the constitution. So let's go back to the president for just a second. He is our chief executive, so he is the He's the top person in charge of enforcing or executing the laws. But he has some other duties that are defined in the Constitution. And to make them easy for me to remember, I call them the four C's. So he is the chief executive. He is our commander in chief. He's our chief diplomat. And he's our ceremonial head of state. And so today I'm really gonna to be talking about what President Clinton did 
as our chief diplomat, but also as our ceremonial head of state. Because diplomacy, diplomacy happens behind the scenes. So that might be negotiating a treaty or a trade agreement, but diplomacy also happens on a stage, literally and figuratively. So the president represents our nation when interacting with other nations. And there's a lot of ceremony with that. So let's get into President Clinton's public diplomacy in Northern Ireland. There we go. Sorry, a little slight delay on my slide advance. Okay, so President Clinton uh, announced early on, actually as a candidate, that he wanted to get involved in Northern Ireland. Now, what is it, what is there to get involved with? Well, uh, Northern Ireland. So if you looked at a map of Ireland, Teresa, Teresa, can you confirm that that slide switched? So now we're looking, are we still looking at my, okay. We're looking at a map. So we see it, perfect. All right, um, I'm gonna add this into my slideshow for our second one, but I, I did wanna show this map. So the United Kingdom includes England, Scotland, Wales, right? And part of the island of Ireland, the Northern part, right? So all that dark green is under one government and all of that light green is under another government. And there are people in Northern Ireland who would like to be a part of a united Ireland. So a part of the whole island would be one government. But there are also people in the Northern Ireland and the dark green part who want to continue to be a part of the United Kingdom. And so there's a conflict there and that conflict has at times been very violent. So President Clinton, as a candidate, said that he wanted to get involved with finding a way to make peace in the region of Northern Ireland. And so while he was campaigning, he said he, he was committing to, he promised that if elected, he would appoint a special envoy. So send somebody over to try to spur progress and putting an end to the troubles. And this met with widespread enthusiasm. Um, President Clinton spoke at numerous conventions and meetings while he was campaigning, including the 1992 Irish American Democratic Candidates Forum. So he got a lot of electoral support. That is a fancy way of saying people voted for him. Right, so you see a button from our collection here, Irish Americans for Clinton Gore. And it's that beautiful Kelly Green we associate with Ireland. All right, so after President Clinton wins the 1992 election, he consults with uh, Senator Edward Kennedy, also known as Teddy Kennedy. Um, and Senator Kennedy suggests that he hire a map expert on Northern Ireland, a woman named Nancy Soderbergh. So Nancy Soderbergh is um, hired by the Clinton White House to serve on the National Security Council. So this is key. She has a lot of history. She has a lot of um, experience and education. So she knows a lot about what's happening in the region and what might help bring these two sides to the table to find peace. Now, you might think I'm showing you the exact same picture that I did before, but if you look, these are two different pictures. So the shamrock ceremony happened year after year. So every year on St. Patrick's Day. And I want you to look very closely, not at President Clinton, but at the Prime Minister of Ireland, because in this picture, it's a different person, right? So there's a change in leadership 
in Ireland during the Clinton administration. President Clinton serves two four-year terms. There we go, two four-year terms. So there's some changes um, in leadership in Ireland, in Northern Ireland. President Clinton felt a close connection. Um, part of this connection is that there are millions of Americans who immigrated to the United States from Ireland. And I'm referring to the whole, the whole island. So President Clinton decided to make Ireland and peace in Ireland, peace in Northern Ireland, uh, a priority in his administration. So um, one of the steps to that was to allow um, the leader of an organization called Sinn Féin, uh, a part of the Irish Republican political party that supported the Irish Republic army to visit the United States. And this was a pretty controversial decision, right? The State Department, the US Department of State actually opposed allowing Jerry Adams to visit the United States, allowing him to have a visa to this country because the IRA was considered to be a terrorist organization. So the Irish Republic Army did not just peacefully protest, did not just peacefully say, we want a united Ireland. There was what we call sectarian violence. So violence against people that did not agree with them. Now, President Clinton saw this as an important way to get these parties to the table, right? To allow Jerry Adams to visit the United States would be a way to open up these conversations. As I mentioned during President Clinton's campaign, he promised to appoint a special envoy. So an envoy is a special kind of diplomat, someone who helps our relationships with other countries. And he named outgoing Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell uh, to this role. And, and Mitchell went to guide that process on the ground. All right, so President Clinton decided that he should go to Northern Ireland and he chose to do so in November of 1995. Well, I should say he went in November of 1995. He decided to go much earlier than that. And there was a lot of planning to take place, right? When the president visits a foreign country, uh, there's a lot of thought and a lot of planning that goes into that deciding where he's going to go, who he's going to talk to. And it was particularly important that President Clinton go to London first. So the seat of government for the United Kingdom. It would have been considered rude to just bypass that seat and go straight to Northern Ireland. Now, part of the team that helps coordinate presidential visits. Um, it's called an advance team. And so this is gonna come up later, but I wanna mention that now. There's a person named Josh King, who was part of the advance team, who wrote a very, very long report that we're gonna look at in just a little while, suggesting different places that President Clinton could go. And the decision was made to really focus on not behind the scenes meetings, not private negotiations with leaders, but what we call public diplomacy. So getting out, meeting with people, really more like a, a presidential campaign. And so that's what they chose to do, really focusing on speeches, public meetings, photo opportunities. And so they also set some goals, some goals for deliverables. So things that would come out of this visit and a range of political and economic agreement, agreements. So one of the ideas was that some of this conflict between Protestants and Catholics, 
living in Northern Ireland, the majority of Protestants supporting the continued rule by the United Kingdom, the majority of Catholics supporting a united Ireland, um, that these conflicts were exacerbated or worsened by economic conflicts, right? It's hard to get along with your neighbor if you are competing for limited resources. So if you think that the Protestant, the United Kingdom's government is unfairly benefiting your Protestant neighbor and you're not able to get a job, that's going to make it harder for you to get along with your neighbor. So it wasn't just about uh, a ceasefire and bringing the different political parties to the table, but also about improving economic conditions. So President Clinton went to London to start his trip to Northern Ireland. He met with the prime minister, who at the time was John Major, and he also visited Buckingham Palace. Right, so part of this diplomacy was part of the, the reason for the stop was really a nod to the existing government of the United Kingdom, which in, at that time was over Northern Ireland. Then President Clinton went on to Northern Ireland and one of his first stops was the Mackey plant. So this was a manufacturing facility that hired both Catholics and Protestants where they worked side by side. And President Clinton um, quoted a speech from an Arkansas governor saying, uh, an Arkansas governor who fought for the union during the Civil War, so the long, um, we have all done wrong. No one can say his heart is altogether clean and his hands altogether pure. Thus, as we wish to be forgiven, let us forgive those who have sinned against us and ours. President Clinton went on to say, that was the beginning of America's reconciliation and it must be the beginning of Northern Ireland's reconciliation. Now, President Clinton also welcomed some school children. You can see here uh, a young man and a young lady holding hands and they're actually um, reading letters about their experiences with violence related to the conflict. Um, and this photo becomes one of the most iconic images of the trip. So then President Clinton, um, chose to go on something called a walkabout. So as they drove to their next location, um, they had two scheduled informal conversations with the public. Um, one in a place that was uh, primarily uh, Catholic and one in a place that was um, primarily Protestant, or in this case, you see the words used loyalist and Republican. So in this case, stopping at Shank Hill, largely loyalist. So that means that most of the people that lived there wanted to remain part of the right? So they liked the government as it was. They didn't want things to change. And then President Clinton also stopped on Falls Road, which is largely Republican. So people who are Republican wanted to be a part of the Republic of Ireland so that the whole island would be governed by one, one government. It would be one country. So at one point um, on, this, on these walkabouts, President Clinton shook hands with Jerry Adams the controversial leader of Sinn Féin. Um, this was very significant. And this showed that that side, um, the, the Republican, including um, the Irish Republican Army, 
was open to sitting down to talk. Now, at the time, um, Hillary Rodham Clinton, so, the, so President Clinton's wife, went to Northern Ireland with him, but she made some stops on her own. So she stopped in South Belfast and she went to a center for women, a women's drop-in center. And she met with um, women on both sides of the conflict who had experienced loss due to the violence associated with the troubles. So people who had lost sons, husbands, brothers, others, other members of their family, um, but who found a way to come together. Uh, and it's interesting because if you just saw this photograph and I didn't tell you about it, you wouldn't realize what was happening, right? It just kind of looks like there's some nice ladies, there's First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, and it looks like they're about to sit down to tea. But sitting down to tea, sharing, breaking bread with one another, sharing a cup of tea and talking and relating to one another, people from different backgrounds, people with different beliefs, it's a big deal. Now, Hillary was inspired by this visit and she um, helped create an organization called Vital Voices. And the idea behind Vital Voices was that women around the globe could be a driving force for peace. That women could find common goals and that they could work together and that they could be a part of moving the peace process forward, not just in Northern Ireland, but internationally across the globe. I wanna point out in this picture in the corner, there's a, a very plain uh, silver teapot. And that silver teapot was actually given to uh, Mrs. Clinton um, at the time and it is on display in the Clinton Presidential Library in an alcove or an area that looks at the work of the First Lady. They also went to Londonderry, which is the home of John Hume. So by this time they come together. So it's the President and the First Lady together. They give another public speech. President Clinton focuses on the work of John Hume leader of the Catholic majority, Social Democrat and Labor Party. And this is important. So John Hume and the, the Social Democratic and Labor Party had rejected the violence of the island, sorry, of the Irish Republican army. President Clinton asked the people of Londonderry to have patience to work for a just and lasting peace. He said that if they reach peace, the United States will reach, if they reach for peace, the United States will reach with you. And then after the speech, he went to a, a closed door event, so a private event um, with the American Ireland Fund and a reception for the inauguration of the Tip O'Neill Chair for Peace Studies at the University of Ulster. So President Clinton a point of visiting different parts of Northern Ireland to speak to different groups of people, different people on both sides of the conflict. Now, the final stop of that day, so we're looking just at a single day, a whole lot of stops, a lot going on. So the trip to, to London is the day before, but all of the rest of this is taking place on November 30th, 1995. And the day culminates with a tree lighting ceremony at Belfast City Hall. So there's a 49 foot white pine that's been donated by uh, the city of Nashville, Tennessee. And President Clinton talks about the ceasefire that's been in place since 1994. 
and the ways that Christmas could prove to be especially joyous because of it, right? If we can stop the violence and find a way to work together, President Clinton challenged the people of Ireland from both sides to forgive the violence of the other and pledge support, the support of the United States to those who take risk for peace. So it was a really big deal. And again, um, children spoke, children on both sides of the conflict spoke at the tree lighting ceremony as well. And then together with the president, they lit this tree. So this doesn't, this is the start a really good start to the peace process. So President Clinton, right, he's engaging in a lot of public diplomacy. So he's out, he's doing events, he's bringing together groups of people, but he's also working behind the scenes. And it takes a lot more behind the scenes, a lot more negotiating. It actually takes another three years until the Good Friday Agreement is signed in 1998. Now, the Good Friday Agreement has largely held, and the Good Friday Agreement uh, was that both sides would um, abandon violent attempts, right? So within a few short years, on a rising swell of enthusiasm for peace, the Good Friday Agreement was signed both by the UK and the Republic of Ireland and it passed a popular vote in both nations. Um, so in 2000, uh, toward the end of his presidency, uh, President Clinton returned to Northern Ireland on a farewell tour. In a speech on December 12, 2000, President Clinton said, in my very first St. Patrick's Day occasion as president, I said I would be a friend of Ireland, not just on St. Patrick's Day, but every day. I have tried to be as good as my word and every effort has been an honor and a gift. So there's a lot more to learn about the conflict in Ireland and about the presidency. And so this is, I'll be sharing my slideshow. Um, with Therese um, so that uh, it can be shared with participants today. Uh, but these are some great links to where you can find more information, not just about the conflict in Northern Ireland and President Clinton's role, um, but also about the presidency. So presidential libraries, we are one of 13 presidential libraries that are under the National Archives and Records Administration. And so the National Archives is responsible for record keeping for all three branches of the federal government. And so what the National Archives is and does is part of what makes our country a democracy. So allowing us to examine the records of our government allows us to hold our elected and appointed officials accountable. So I wanna take you, this is what the digital library looks like. I'm actually gonna take you there in just a second. But if you were to go to the digital library, the digital library, including the one that I've given you an overview of today, uh, it's called Days Like This, President Clinton's Public Diplomacy in Northern Ireland. Digital library exhibits are curated collections of records. So the Clinton Digital Library has every record that we have that's been digitized, well, released, so made available to the public and digitized. All right. So I wanna open the floor to questions. Um, it looks like Klaus already has a question. Are we a democracy? Are we a republic? Um, the United States is a representative democracy. Right, so each person has a vote, but then we elect um, senators and representatives to, um, to 
be in Congress to pass the laws. We elect a president to enforce the laws. And then the president appoints the members of the Supreme Court and other members of the federal court uh, judges to determine if the laws are constitutional. It's not just the laws, but also how they are implemented. Now, I wanna take you briefly to the digital library. Um, and you can see the digital library is, um, well, the digital library is huge and you can search in the digital library, but I mentioned the digital library exhibits are curated collections. So when I say that, I mean that they are like a museum exhibit or even like a book with chapters. And so this book, the chapters are listed on the side. So you can look at things like President Clinton's decision to get involved and you'll recognize some of the photos from my presentation, but you'll also see documents that you can read, right? So this is a letter from the Clinton campaign. And then you'll also see videos that you can watch. So this is President Clinton at the dedication of the Kennedy Presidential Library in 1993. Technically the rededication, uh, the Clinton president, uh, I'm sorry, the Kennedy Presidential Library had redone their exhibits and, and were reopening. And you can see President Clinton talking about his relationship with the Kennedys and that is key to his interest in Northern Ireland. With the Good Friday Agreement, we're all citizens of Ireland receiving fair opportunities for employment and resources. I think that kind of depends on, on who you ask, right? So the, the Good Friday Agreement was primarily about um, ending uh, violent opposition violent conflict between the two sides. And certainly President Clinton did make an effort to spur um, US economic investment, uh, both private and public in Ireland, um, because I think that was key to, to helping the two sides get along. But that, that's a really good question. So does the IRA no longer exist? Um, that is also a really good question. Um, this, this whole thing is not completely resolved, right? So Northern Ireland is still separate from the rest of Ireland. Um, and it's actually, um, uh, there was a vote um, in Northern Ireland about whether or not to reunite with Ireland and the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted against that. Now, um, the United Kingdom, right? You, you may have heard of something called Brexit. So the United Kingdom has actually voted not that long ago, a couple of years, um, voted to not be a part of the European Union. And there was some thought that that might help um, have a, a, a reunited Ireland, Northern Ireland and Ireland being one country and that potentially that they would rejoin the European Union, but it's, it's all still up in the air right now. Uh, nothing's, been, nothing's been fully decided. All right, are there other questions? All right, do I have any questions from my classes who are, I see Birchwood Blue Hills Charter. 
And I think we've got the Salem Lutheran School that's calling in. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up, either in the chat box or over audio? All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So thank you so much, Kathleen. We so appreciate your time and all your knowledge that you've shared with us. And thank you everybody who joined. It was a pleasure to have you. Um, and we hope to see you again at some future presentations. Thanks so much. All right, thank you guys. Have a great afternoon, bye.